three, two. Terry says we're live, and we're a little bit early tonight for those following along. So if you're driving down the road and all of a sudden your Facebook page lights up and says Williston Methodist is live, we're a little bit early tonight because we're going to leave a little bit early tonight because some special um, events that are going on afterwards, some fellowship down at the ice cream shop. But certainly we're glad everyone who's following along is continuing as we continue along in our study in the book of Acts. So make sure I say that right. And we are in chapter 2. We're going to finish chapter 2 tonight and move into chapter 3. Uh, we'll move a little quicker than we have been tonight because there's a lot of narrative in part, the second part. But uh, I want us to pay, suppose, pay close special attention to this latter part and think about you are a part and really part of what we're going to study tonight. I mean, we're living it out. If you don't realize it, then... Come meet us afterwards and we'll open your eyes to it. But certainly, so we'll continue in Acts. And I'm going to open this with prayer. And then I guess Hetty's going to read tonight, right? Okay. So let's open with prayer. Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege it is to be in your house. We thank you for uh, the special opportunities to gather together. And as we're going to read tonight, we are literally fulfilling exactly what the early church was doing from place to place. We're going to see it play itself out tonight. I personally thank you for the opportunity it is to teach. As Will Graham taught me the other day, I pray that you would get out of the way and get, in, get into me and teach, or get me out of the way and get into me to teach tonight. And we lift up all the unspoken requests that people gave us before we started tonight. You answer those in the way that you see fit and ask that you speak through me tonight. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I said, we're continuing in the study of Acts, which is the life of the church. We saw the church begin a couple of weeks ago. This book written by the... Um, Luke, the physician, the theologian, the pastor, historian, and this is part two to Luke. Well, when Luke ends, Luke ended off with Jesus buried and rising into heaven. It picks up, and then we had what happened. So we are actually chronologically some fifty something, maybe sixty, seventy days after Jesus went back to heaven, and we've had the church begin at Pentecost. And uh, Dr. MacArthur always says, if you're a pastor or teacher, you like the mood to be set. But how else better could you be set than the Holy Spirit falling and uh, clothes of fire over people's head and the wind blowing and the Spirit, spirit falling and people talking in different languages. And then the great sermon that Peter gave in which, you might remember how many people were saved? 3,000 3, souls were saved is where we stopped off at. And we're going to pick up with that as the church is moving forward. The church has begun. The Holy Spirit has empowered the problem. Well, there's no problem. There's at least 120, maybe more than that, uh, people, apostles, and women in, of the church moving forward. And the church is beginning to grow and expand. And when Hedy begins in verse 42, we're going to see how it, what they did. And I want it to compare it to what we were talking about. One of the bailiffs I and I were talking today, and he says, you know, He's a member of a large church. He says, but the men's small group is where we grow best. You'll see that play itself out tonight. So, Hedy, let's read 42 through 47 at first. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and in breaking of bread, and in prayer. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And that's the word of God for the people of God. And certainly may God bless the reading and the exposition of the word. If you break down the New Testament, the epistles, when I say the epistles, uh, John, and, excuse me, 1 John, 2 John, Peter, Philippians, Colossians, Galatians, and all those are the epistles. You know, the epistles really shape the doctrine for the life of the church. I mean, it's really how we are supposed to live and, and run today. 
Acts, as we're going through slowly but surely, back to, as Hedy says back there, is really tracing the application of that doctrine in the history of the early church. We are really started at the beginning from that 120 people in that upper room that was turned to 3,000, and now they begin to follow the church and become the church the way we know it today. The passage that Hedy just really, really describes the outworking of what the ideal first church is supposed to be. Me and the guy talked about it today. He said, you know, the, really, this is what the ideal church should be. Not music and dancing and carrying on and shows on the TV and pu puppet shows and all this. This is what the early church was supposed to be and what church should be today. I'm not saying those things are wrong to have shows and all these things, but truly, if you want to follow what the church does and what happened, the very last thing Hedy said, and they were added daily to the church may go to show that we fought, strayed far away from it while the church don't grow the way it did. But it really begins the ideal of the first local church and really describes the newborn church in its prime prime because it was pure, it was on fire, it was moving, and then slowly but surely it began, I don't say deteriorate, Ephesus was really doing everything it was supposed to do. If you remember your churches from <coughs> Revelation and then they had done something, left their first love. Persecution came, tolerance came, uh, compromise came, deadness came, lukewarmness came, and it was all downhill from there. This is the church in its prime as we read it, and where it possessed truly the devotion to the Lord that's been unmatched and succeed in generations. So in this brief little cameo of the early church, we're going to see three dimensions of this church, and I want it to compare to our churches as a whole that we attend, small groups and all the things, and we'll see how these distinguishing marks are that really lead us on. First of all, look about the spiritual duties of the early church. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Guess what? To the breaking of bread and to prayer. So this was really a church, nothing more, nothing less. Like I said, they didn't have computers with bands playing and high praise and worship. This was pure church, nothing more, nothing left. A life that was completely defined by devotion to the spiritual duties that they had been called to do. The first thing it was is they were a saved church. The 3,000 who had confessed faith in Christ and were baptized in the previous verses are the they that picks up who were showing the genuous in their faith as we begin to move forward. Despite the ridicule and the persecution that was getting ready to come, that was the mark of true, genuine salvation. Jesus would say over in John 8, verse 31, here we go again, guys from John, if you, what? Abide, there's that word, we just can't get out of it in Sunday school, now here. If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine. And the true branch will abide in the vine. These people were abiding. They were in the faith. In contrast, uh, the Apostle John writes of those who were false believers. Quote, they went out from us, but they were not really of us. For if they had been of us, they would have remained with us. But they went out in order that it might be shown that they are not of us. So John was saying those people who claimed they were members of the church and they were believers and all that, when the heat turned on, when it come time to have a sacrifice for the faith, guess what? They left. And John says, you want to know what, a, of course, now I'm taking this back to literally into our, what our study school and first John is doing. John says, you want to know what a true believer is? The person who stays till the end. He always had the question, well, I remember Uncle Joe, he sat right there. He was in church every Sunday, but the older he got, regularly he just quit and never went. John would say, well, he was never part of the church. Because if he would have, he would have stayed. I'm not going to get into the arguments of eternality and all that, but certainly John is, makes it clear, if you're not there to the end, something was not right and you weren't there. So this early church was composed of the same, excuse me, the same, in, the same individuals. Uh, and of course, Dr. MacArthur goes on talking about, you know, the, the church is really should be made up of true believers and unbelievers are welcome because they need to come in and be converted to become believers. You know, there's some churches that would you know, shun you away if you're not members of the, of the clique, a member of the group. But certainly, everyone is invited. But what did Jesus say? The sick, I didn't come to save the, uh, the health, I come to save the sick. So if you can't 
minister to them, you need to get them in here. But truly the church and church membership and church conferences and officers really should be restricted to believers and believers only. Not everybody that just walks in should be put in up here to teach. They need to be tested. Paul would take that and run with that over in Thessalonians. But this early church was doing it. They were continually devoting themselves. They were um, had passed the initial test of spiritual duty and were only those who were following the faith. Now, so it was a saved church, those who, those who were continually devoting themselves, but they were a scriptural church. They were following the apostles' teaching. Now, guys, they didn't have the Bible like we have it now. They had the teaching. The New Testament was just their teaching. They had the Old Testament. It hadn't been codified at this point. So the content for what the early church believed and studied was revealed truth. And God designed that church and the church today to have the gospel proclaimed, the word. You don't get up here and tell stories and read uh, little comic books and tell, you know, you, go, you and tell little stories and little skits. You get up there and you preach the truth. The early church was teaching the apostles' doctrine. Paul mandated such a, a priority all throughout his epistles where he described this process to Timothy. And here's what he told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many right witnesses these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others. So you see what it has is James and John and Peter and all these heard the truth from Jesus. They told the people who came to faith. They passed it on to those people and it passed down and down and down and down the generation. So they had a commitment to the apostles' teaching. And certainly it was foundational to the growth and the spiritual health of that church, the church today. Peter would write over in 1 Peter 2.2, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the world, word, that by it you may grow in respect to salvation. You're not going to grow on, you know, Nancy playing the piano and singing a little bit. You've got to hear the word and apply it. That's how you grow physically. Now, that's going to help. If I add a little fire to it, that, that in itself, you've got to hear the word, Paul says, by the work and the milk of the word. To the Romans, Paul would say, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Starts with the mind, goes to the heart. Paul would later write to Timothy and to Titus about the priority of preaching the word. He says, and point out these things to the brethren, you will be a good servant of Christ, constantly nourished on the words of the faith and of the sound doctrines which you've been following. Sounds to me like these early guys didn't get up here and they weren't worried about allegories and stuff. I doubt they would have, they, they may have been boring in today's vernacular, that they only got up and they talked directly from the scripture. One, a couple more, I want to just get, uh, Paul would say in Timothy, until I come, give, it, give attention to the public reading of scripture to exhortation and teaching. Now I'm just beating a dead horse here. Over and all of these scriptures I can just give you over and over here, the word, the word, the word, the word, the word. All right. Sometimes you just got to quote your commentary, and I got to love this by Dr. MacArthur. He says, quote, a believer should count it a wasted day when he does not learn something new from or is not more deeply enriched by the truth of God's word, end quote. Wow. Read that one more time. That's pretty good. <laughs> a believer should count it a wasted day when he or she does not learn something new from or is not more deeply enriched by the truth of the word of God. If you don't read it, you can't get that way, right? So that's why we should be reading every day. Um, and so the early church was sitting under the teaching ministry of the apostles whose teaching we now have written on the pages of the New Testament. And certainly it is to be taught rightly by pastors today. Hopefully that's what they're doing. He goes on to talk about Scripture being food for our growth and power. Here's another quote. I know us expositional people will love this. The church today ignores the exposition and application of Scripture at its peril. As the warning of Hosea to Israel suggests in Hosea 4.6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So anyway, just want to do that. The apostles' teaching is what was growing in the early church. So that's one of the things that we have to do is have those positions of authority for those who are believers and, believe they, and those who are there are continually in, the, in teaching the truth. Here's something that we all, that I know this group loves. It was a fellowship church. 
Fellowship is the spiritual duty of believers. What we do is stimulate each other towards holiness and faithfulness. <clears throat> now, unfortunately, some people don't always do that. Sometimes we bring troubles in that shouldn't be here. But ultimately, true fellowship really is to stimulate. I'm supposed to push Peter a little bit faster than he would go by himself. He's supposed to push me, almost like accountability. We get together and we say, and we move each other in the direction that we need to go. It's that one another is in the New Testament. And MacArthur's got a string of different uh, scriptures. If you want them, I'll email them to you <laughs> of what it talks about fellowship. The word fellowship means partnership or sharing. Those people who actually believe, receive Christ as their Savior really become a partner with him. And guess what? Not just a partner with Jesus. All of us are partners. Going back to 1 John, remember when we did 1 John in Sunday school, one of the signs, if you're a true believer, is you love the brethren. Paul, John says, if you don't like being with your brethren, something wrong. You've got to love the brethren. And he's picking up on it again here, uh, in, or Luke's picking up on it, talking about being fellowship and share. <clears throat> the joy associated with the loss that comes with it, everything people share, and that's the idea of fellowship. We share, share our joys, share our downs, get on each other's nerves, but ultimately <laughs> it's one family and we're built. I'm going to read, I'm going to quote him again. For a Christian to fail to participate in the life of a local church is inexcusable. Quote, quote, Dr. MacArthur. In fact, those who choose to isolate themselves are disobedient to the varied commands of Scripture. Hebrews 10, 24 charges believers, quote, consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds not forsaking our own assembling together as in the habit of sun, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day is drawing. So it's not only a, if we don't get involved and encourage one another church, not only are we failing to participate in the life, but we're actually disobedient because Hebrews tells us we're supposed to do it. Because if we're not, hey, you don't need to be part of it. Why would you join the church if you're not? The Bible, quote, does not envision the Christian life as one lived apart from others and as member of the church we're to be actively and involved in our local assembly, doing things together. So this early church was a church of fellowship. It was a church of scriptural reading. It was a church of believers. And it was a Christ-centered church. The fellowship that we talked about was symbolized by obedience to something else that we do. The spiritual duty of breaking of bread. Now the breaking of bread is a reference to, you might know what it's a reference to? Lord's Supper, we do it once a month. Some churches do it every day. And I got a friend that goes to the Christian church. I think they do it every Sunday. Uh, and when I was at Stacy, I thought we might do it once a quarter, I think. And I think we did it at Baptist Church once a quarter. Uh, but, you know, it's the idea of breaking the bread, reference to the celebration of communion, the Lord's Supper. The duty is not optional. Since the Lord commanded every believer to remember and do those things. Yeah, in communion, all believers meet on common ground at the foot of the cross. Since all of us are saved by grace, communion acknowledges the work of the Lord and further exemplifies the unity of believers as we all come to the table and gather together as one. Nobody's more important. Now, that was part of what got the Corinthian church had upset. If we ever get a chance to study that book sometimes, correct? That was a bad church. I mean, they when they come to the communion, there was Angie over here, and she had her wine and her caviar over here and then of course Nancy's over here eating can and beans and uh, there was uh, Granny and Audrey they were had drunk partook of too many and they were laying passed out the floor all part of the celebration and Peter says well wait a minute we're supposed to be sharing or Paul says we're supposed to be sharing here and some of you are drunk and some of you are over here eating your caviar and not giving any to Nancy and she might have a canned bean over here to eat some sardines but you know we're supposed to be sharing and Paul really got into their crawl about it but this early church was a Christ-centered church of having communion and breaking bread. As a matter of fact, Paul in Corinthians says, quote, Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Question mark. Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Question mark. Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of one bread. And all I can think of is that song that we sing. One bread, one body. When we do communion. So communion was a time when they came together and they broke the bread. Certainly communion also is a call for a time for self-examination. And thus uh, cleansing of the things that we've done wrong 
and purifying not only the believers, but the church as a whole. So nothing was more vital to the early church than the ongoing, regular gathering together for the Lord's table and examining themselves when it came time to eat. Now we know that we read Paul would later on say to examine yourself because many people have gotten sick and some have actually died by not clearing their conscience when it comes time to taking bread at the table. Anyway. Yeah. So it was a Christ-centered church. It was a praying church. The first fellowship was very eagerly and persistently engaged in that critical duty of prayer, which seems hard. I don't know why. It seems like every time you try to do that, something comes in your mind. Somebody calls, the phone rings, somebody texts, something pops up and you want to look at it, or somebody knocks on the door when it's time to try to have some alone time, you know. I, MacArthur was full of quotes on this book, this section. Quote, prayer is the slender nerve that moves the mu muscles of omnipotence. You want to hear that one more time? I love that one. I got this with Mark. Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscles of omnipotence. Omnipotence knowing everything and all knowledge. So it takes that little strength, little strand of prayer to get the muscle of God working. Now we know good. Understanding the sense of loss, the disciples were feeling the Lord promised, quote, in John 14, whatever you ask in my name, I will do. And the, so that the Father may be glorified. So if you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. And the early church literally took that promise as the source of of God's provision. Anything they needed, they prayed for. They went to the prayer, and that was there. <clears throat> prayer uh, was that not only so much as the individuals, but as the co uh, church corporately of prayer. So it was something very important of uh, prayer. <clears throat> so we see some of, the some of the ideas of this early church. How about the spiritual character of this early church? That would begin to. So, a church that fulfills those spiritual duties that we've been talking about, gathering together, breaking bread, uh, praying, and doing these things, will find that they produce some spiritual character of this early church. Check this out. It was a very awe inspiring church. I think I'm reading from the NASB here. It says that everyone kept feeling a sense of awe or reverence in the early church, a, a, a holy terror, a fear related to the sense that they were in the presence of the Holy God. The early church was involved. It describes the feeling uh, produced when one realizes when God was at hand. Remember over in Acts, well, we haven't got there yet. Acts 5, <laughs> if you've studied it, uh, the power that people felt when they saw Ananias and Sapphira die. Guys, we'll get to that maybe in about two weeks, I think. Uh, two to three weeks, remember, they... Barnabas had sold the money and everybody was satisfied and Ananias and Sapphira came in and said, ah, we sold it, here's money for it. But they lied about it and all of a sudden it fell dead. When the spirit killed them, all of a sudden people were like, they were a sense of fear and awe. Same word that was going through this church. They were in awe. The same word that described the citizens of Ephesus when um, the demon-possessed man was there and the Lord cast it, cast it out. Same feeling when the Lord way, raised the widow of Nun's, Nain's son. There was a fear and power there. A sense of awe. They weren't being awed by the buildings and the programs, but by the character and the power that was flowing through these guys, and that was the Spirit of God. They were really on, on fire about it. <clears throat> it was not just an awe-inspiring, but it was a miraculous church. And John, I knew I'd do that, John. P Peter, John, all these guys. Luke, excuse me, would write, and there were many wonders and signs taking place there through the apostles. We're going to read one in just a few minutes. I hope I can get to it. So one reason why they felt awe and reverence during their first fellowship was the many wonders and signs that were being performed by the apostles themselves. Some of these are going to be described as we go through it. We're going to see one in just a few minutes. A man lame from birth, he will write up. We're going to see... Uh, People, raising people from the dead. We're going to see later on a guy fall out, fall out the third story, falls down dead. By the time Peter, Paul goes there and picks him up, he's healed. We're going to see Peter raise Dorcas from the dead, or Tabitha, whatever her name, whichever version you see from it. People raising from the dead. We're going to see demons cast out, not done by Jesus, but done by the apostles. They had seen Jesus, now they do it. The wonders and signs we know they were doing it weren't just so... <clears throat> they could tap patch each other on the back and say, Peter, guess what? I, uh, I raised Dorcas from the dead. 
Peter said, well, I healed a blind man. So it's not so we can brag to who is it, but to show the power that was flowing through these guys so that people would come to understand that these miracles were done by none other than the power of God. And Jesus told the same thing in John 14 to the disciples. He says, do you not believe that I am? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I don't speak on my own initiative. But the Father, there's that word again, abiding in me, does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. Otherwise, believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater work than these shall he do, because I go to the Father. So the ability to perform miracles was given to those to show what was going on in the world and the power, or excuse me, the power that was there. But remember, they didn't have the Bible to open up and say, well, what did John say about this or what did Peter say about it? They could only see the miracles and it really drew the miracles to confirm who they were. It was a sharing church. <clears throat> in these early days before strife and division come and affects the church as it does more so now because there's a church in every corner, all those who had believed, Luke says, were together. They not only possessed the spiritual oneness because they were under one father, but they had a practical oneness that was going through them. Here's what Luke says. They had, they had all things in common. Now, this is where some people say, well, see, they were already communist. It's not what he's talking about here. Uh, this was not some kind of communal communistic living. The first Christian fellowship was not a commune, nor does it offer any support for that. The, Jesus has made, or the, God has made the family to be that, to taken care of. But they had a, such a sharing and mutual concern that they were meeting the needs of other people who were in their membership. Now that had gone back, <clears throat> truth me, that really wasn't new. There was a long-standing tradition in Israel during the religious feast, because remember when they had the feast, people would come from all over the world. Uh, they would come from southern Israel, northern Israel, different parts of the world, and they would have to be accommodated in a place. The inns were full. Remember going back to um, the Christmas time? The inns were full, and people were staying in people's houses, different places. So uh, the inns couldn't accommodate them, so people would turn their homes and share their resources with the visitors. And many members of the early church were pilgrims because what they say? we read a laundry list about two weeks ago of all the people who were there that got saved at the early church. They were from like Persia, they were from uh, Lydia, Libya, all those different places. And guess what? They didn't get in the car and drive back home or get on an airplane. They had to stay somewhere. And so they would stay in the houses of those who were believers. Uh, and they had to have, you know, that he only bought so much, and so everybody had to provide food and water and drink for these things. So the, these people would have fellowship with one another, and they would meet each other's needs by providing food, shelter, and drink, whatever they were there. And it wasn't just to the poor people, it was all the people who lived there. Now, we, that's why people say, well, you see, they seem to be kind of communist, but it was not communism or a primitive form of it because it says it was a continuous action. They were selling and sharing. It was something they did all the time. It was um, not something like, you know, because uh, if you're part of a communist regime, guess what? You sell everything you got and all the money goes into the pot so everybody is equal. Now these people, not everybody were doing it because we're going to find out in a few minutes. They're staying in people's homes so some people didn't sell their homes. But these people, if they would pull their assets together so that everything would have it, and they weren't forced to do it, they did it of their own free will, which is what got Ananias and Sapphira in a little bit of trouble we're going to get when we get over to chapter 5. We see in verse 46 that uh, Hattie read that the end, there were some still individuals owning their pro homes because people were gathered in each other's homes. So what actually was happening was people were selling their property if they saw somebody in need. There's Peter Folks there, and the poor fellow is about to starve to death. He ain't got a, what do we say as young as a pot to pee in. And there's James back there, and he's got a nice rifle back there. And he said, well, I only use it to shoot on weekends. And Al says, well, I got an old Corvette that is on blocks. I hate to get rid of it, but I'm going to sell it to Ed. We're going to scrap it. And they would take the money and give it to Peter so he'd have something to eat and a place to live. That's what they were doing. They were selling the things they had so that everybody could have something they need. Nobody was forcing them to do it. 
key. The diff that's the difference between being a communist regime and being a, is the government forces you to do it if you're a socialist. These people were doing it of their own free will because they loved and cared for one another. That's the early church. And because they had the spirit. Yeah. That's it. That's what, they were sacrificing their cares and things and goods for the benefit of the whole. A little bit different than the way the church runs today, right? But it's the way it's supposed to be. And to an extent, it still is. I mean, you know, all that you say that, you know, all of all the FEMA funds and the government funds that come out during d disasters, it's the churches who usually step up and take care of people. Provide food, provide uh, shelter, uh, and do whatever they can. That's what the early church was doing. They were sharing and uh, doing everything together. And we'll see that continuing on. But sharing was not just limited to their material possessions, you know. But included spiritual things in ministry. Luke says, day by day, they continued with one accord or one mind meeting in the temple. The temple was still there at the time. They would go up to the temple and they would meet in those hours of prayer and they would witness. We're going to see some of that start to play forward as we get into chapter 3. Now, of course, we know they still had a right to go to the temple even though they were going to find themselves in trouble every time they'd go up there because what did Jesus say? It was my father's house. And certainly they had one of mine in unity when they went up. Now, here's where I said you were literally a part of what the early church was doing tonight. Their time as a fellowship were not just limited to the time they went to the temple on the Sabbath. Luke says they were breaking bread from house to house and taking their meals together. Breaking bread certainly once again to the communion table and the service, and the taking of meals together, the love feast that comes along. So guys, what they were doing is they, I mean, we're so much, we meet here, but we used to meet at the house, and we've done the bills more so sometimes, but they would gather together, have a little meal, read the scripture, pray together, and then go home. The next night, they'd go to Peter's house, do the same thing. The next week, they'd be at Ed's house. Then they'd go to Nancy's house. Not unlike what we're doing now. They would gather together and teach in small groups. This is where David Jeremiah says in his church they get the 2020 groups from. And where they would gather in small groups, usually less than 20 people, because he says if you get over 16 to 20 people, you lose some of the intimacy. You know how you all feel a lot better if there's only a few of us here? You'll say stuff you wouldn't ordinarily say, but if, it's, if we were filled to the rafters, I would say, I'm not going to say anything because they think I'm crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but the early church certainly was gathering together and they were having the love feast and sharing food, breaking bread and doing the things that they were called as one. Certainly modeling the principle that Peter would say, quote, be hospitable to one another without complaint. And Paul, at this present time, your abundance being a supply for the want, that their abundance also may become a supply for your want, that, they may, that there may be equality as it is written, he who gathered much did not have too much and he who gathered little had no lack. They gathered together and shared all the things together. And as a result, they were a joyful church. They would gather and they would do these things, not saying, oh my gosh, it's over to Cheryl's house. I got to go over there tonight. I don't, I don't really want to do it, but you know, I got to go over there. She might have got some can, but she might have some beans and I, she just can't cook very good. But hey, I know it's fellowship time. No, they did it with joy and sincerity in heart, Luke's right. So it should come as a surprise that people were gathering together in this miraculous environment, sharing these things together, that they were joyful, they were gladness, they were rejoicing. That's what that word translates. And one of the key reasons that they had it was because they had sincerity in heart. They had no other reason to go there but to, to fellowship and learn more about God. They didn't go there so that their granny would say, oh, I'm glad he went tonight. He's, he's a good fellow. He goes up there and teaches and Audrey's up there, you know, she's doing good on that. They did it because it was very simple. They wanted to be there, they enjoyed being there, and they fellowshiped together. Wouldn't you love, I mean, wouldn't you love, love to have been a part of this early church? And then not only did that, they would begin to praise the Lord, praising and producing joy. And certainly, that translates to me and to recite the works and the attributes. They had written. Could you imagine having Peter standing here? And Peter said, you remember that day when we were down by the river and uh, we looked and there was the Lord came in and he told me to cast the net on the other side of the fish. And I said, nah, we've been doing it all night. And we threw it and there was some the net began to break. You remember that miracle? 
And they began to compare stories, and all of a sudden they began to encourage one another with the joy that was happening. So certainly they were glad and joyous and praising the Lord for everything they were doing. The last thing is they had a great spiritual impact. They were having favor with all people. So the duties and the character that was granted to them that they were doing was giving them favor with all the people they come into contact with. Wouldn't you want to be part of something like this? I mean, if you had been part of the synagogue and you, you, know, you couldn't go in there and do anything unless the high priest was there and now you've got all these people breaking bread together and sharing potluck together and sharing some ice cream and cake and all that good stuff. Yeah, they're, they're going there. They were still going to the temple, but they were being open about all the things they were doing, and people were excited about it. They wanted to be a part of it. And it was one of the things that they were loving. i got to read this here. I know it's just too good. He says, some of the reasons they found favor was this. This is what people were thinking about the early church, written by uh, Rendell Harris in his Apologies of the Ancient Age. Here's what they, Josephus and the guys said in his apologies. Now the Christians, O oh king, writing a letter to the king that time, they, were, they would go about and they were seeking. They had found the truth, for they know and they trust in God, the maker of heaven and earth, who has no fellow. From him they received those commandments which they had engraved on their minds and which they observed in the hope and expectation of the world to come. They were looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. For this reason, guys, they didn't commit adultery. They didn't get caught up in normality. They didn't bear false witness. They didn't embezzle, nor did they covet what was theirs. They honored their father and their mother, and they did good to those who were their neighbors. And where, whenever they were judges, they judged rightly. They don't worship idols made in the image of man. And whatever they, whatever they do not wish that others should do to them, they in turn do not do. And they do not eat food sacrificed to idols. And those who oppress them, they exhort and make them their friends. They do good to their enemies. Their wives, O king, are pure as virgins, and their daughters are modest. Their men abstain from unlawful sexual comment and from impurity in the hope of being repaid to them when they come into the next world. As far as for their bondsmen and bondswomen and their children, if there are any, they persuade them to become Christians, and when they've done so, they call them brethren without distinction. They refuse to worship strange gods, and they go their way in humility and cheerfulness. Falsehood is not found among them. They love one another. The widow's needs are not ignored, and they rescue the orphan from the person who does violence. He who has, he who has gives, excuse me, he who has gives to him who has not, and he does it ungrudgingly and without boasting. When the Christians find a stranger, they bring him to their homes and rejoice over him as if he's a true brother. Brother, they do not call brethren those who are bound by blood ties alone, but all those who are under the spirit of the same God. When one of their poor passes away from this world, each provides for his barrier according to their ability. If they hear of any of their number who are in prison or oppressed for the name of the Messiah, they provide for his needs and, if possible, to try to redeem them and get them free. If they find poverty in their midst and they don't have spare food, then they fast two or three days in order that the needy might be supplied with the necessities. They observe scrupulously the commandments of their Messiah. They live honestly, soberly, as the Lord God ordered them. And every morning and every hour they praise and thank God for his goodness and for their food and drink that they offer thanksgiving for. If any righteous person of their number passes away from the world, they rejoice and thank God and escort his body as if he were setting out from one place to another. When a child is born to one of them, they praise God. If he dies in infancy, they thank God. I lost my place there. If the child dies in infancy, they thank God the more as for one who has passed through the world without sin. But if one of them dies in his sins, they grieve bitterly and sorrow as over one who is about to meet his doom. Such, O king, is the commandment given to the Christians, and such is their conduct. That was a description written by this guy in his reference to the king of how Christians were living during that day. With all of that virtuous commandment, is there any wonder that it was an attractive church? And as a result, they were a growing church. And Luke says, and they were adding to their number day by day those who were coming to the faith. So they were a very effective evangelist, and they were adding, the Lord was adding, there's that supernatural sovereignty of the God bringing into the faith all of those to salvation. And day by day, more and more people were giving their life to the Lord and coming to faith in Christ. So, to sum that up, this brief glimpse of the early church gives, should give us variable insight to what makes a healthy church today. And that would be provoke, certainly proper devotion to the duties that we've seen 
uh, being and helping one another. So certainly it was a church that was growing because of the attractiveness of it. So that's why I said it, that would have been a very good church to have been a member of. And we, when you get to Revelation, you read the uh, letter to the church at Ephesus, which was a letter written to this, this particular church age. And they were really a great church to be in, but as unfortunately by the time the Lord wrote that letter, some probably about 30 or 40 years from this time, they had gotten so caught up in doing things that they lost their first love and the Lord told them to repent. Okay. Well, now that we got that, now it's time to get to the action. I told you once we got to chapter 3, the action is going to start. We're going to read some goodies between now and the time that we close this study sometime next year. Hattie, right? let's read the first 11 verses in chapter 3. Thank you for reading that. So this is finally some of the action. We get to the action. I remember when <clears throat> we studied this the, many moons ago, uh, we had a running idea that that was, uh, thank you, Hetty, was the uh, on the way to prayer meeting. It was a miracle. So this, let's set the scene. Now, as we move into chapter 3, as I said, the action really begins to heat up now as we begin to do it. The Holy Spirit selects one of those many wonders and signs. Remember the early church was full of wonders and signs that caused people all? This is one of those. And begins this miraculous healing of this lame man who was there and there was a huge crowd there. Now the Gospels really reveal Peter and John very closely associated. According to Luke 5, remember, they were partners in a fishing industry before they went into the ministry. Along with the brothers, James, John, Peter, actually James and John, Peter, and Andrew, they all had some kind of inner, they were part of the inner circle, but were also part of the fishing industry for there. So Jesus began to bring these guys together, and they began to do a lot of things together. We're going to see that Jesus really entrusted them with a lot of things. He entrusted them with making preparations for the Passover. Remember the last Passover they did? They went in to find that, the donkey and all the colt. They were they alone of the twelve followed Jesus to the high priest that night. Even though Peter kind of scooted out, they were there. And certainly were the first two remember that went to the tomb, the first two guys. So they were intimately together. Now the imperfect sense that Hetty read was they were going. So that means it wasn't a one time incident. It was they were continually going up to the temple, suggests that it was very custom for them to go frequently, every day probably to the temple. And they went on the ninth hour. Anybody know what time of day that was? Three o'clock. It would be about three in the afternoon according to Jewish reckoning, which counted hours from sunrise and went forward. So around sun, which was around six o'clock, they would add the hours. So about three o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, Psalm 55, 17 mentions the three hours of prayer. The other two being in the morning at the third hour and then noon at 
the sixth hour. So the ninth hour was, there was something also special that happened at the ninth hour. Anybody know what it would happen? It was still going on at this time, but it was getting ready to do away with. Not so much the eclipse, but something that goes on it would go on around 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Jesus. Hour of the evening sacrifice. It was when the, they would have, remember, at around 3 o'clock, it was the time they sacrificed. It would be the hour when the evening sacrifice would happen. Thus, it would be the most busiest time of the day. It was packed. So these guys, as they're accustomed, were on their way to the temple, and they encounter a certain man that Luke says, because he's Dr. Luke, he knows, this guy had been lame since the time he came out of his mama's womb, so he was born that way. Maybe he had a birth defect. Maybe something was wrong. But anyway, he was born and could not. He was crippled from birth. Thus, he was hopeless in that day. They didn't have welfare, didn't have Social Security, disability to take care of him. He was hopeless unless people paid money for him. And it was something that the doctors couldn't cure him from. Certainly, you know, Luke would have known if it had been. He couldn't be cured. So the imperfect tense, there's that imperfect, there's for the English majors, remember, of the verb translate, was being carried. Um, tells us that he had, every day he had somebody pick him up from wherever his house was and carry him that time every day to that location. So he was carried, picked up every day and carried to that location where he was at. Now, it's important why he's there. You want to find out the reason why he's there. Now, Luke goes on and tells us the gates of the temple where he was at was called the beautiful gate. Um, it was the perfect site for a crippled, crippled man to go beg for alms and money. Because what were they doing? People were going to the temple to do sacrifices to f get forgiveness of sins. So they would come out spiritually cleansed. And one of the duties they were supposed to do was take care of the poor. So who better to give it to than him? He's sitting right there. So he was at the perfect place for people who were willing to take care of somebody. So he was at the very place. Beggars certainly in this time period, according to the commentary, favored three locations to be at to try to get alms and get help from people. Number one was the houses of the rich. Remember the story of Lazarus and the beggar? They would put him at the gate, and so he would try to get scraps from him. So if you were wealthy, poor people would hang out outside of your gate. Hopefully you would pay them a little something. The second way would be on the main highways where traffic was coming and going. We were running the people. And thirdly would be the temple. Now, which of those three do you think the best place to be to get alms would be at? The temple. Because, hey, you might not have religious leaders on the highway, and the rich man might not be a righteous man, but you wouldn't go to the temple unless you were righteous, right? Or trying to earn your favor with God. And one of the ways you would do it, read it in your pocket and give, you know, there's uh, Audrey, she's down and out, and she's sitting there, oh, well, yeah, okay, here you go. Here's a quarter. Yeah, here's something to help you out, try to make you feel better. So that was what they were doing there. Uh, so not only did crowds throng there, and it was huge crowds, and especially that time of day, but most of them come to impress God. Because remember, these are still under the old Jewish law, and they were coming. And one way that they thought they could get fa find favor with God was to give alms to the poor. Furthermore, as only MacArthur tells us, the temple treasury was there, and people would carry money to put offerings in the offering there. So that means they had money. It was the perfect time, the perfect attitude, the perfect place to go get on. So this man was in the perfect place to get it. So therefore, these people who were coming there would have money. They'd be in the perfect frame of mind to be charitable or philanthropic, as we would say today. That's a big word. Uh, when they came to the temple. Now, the beautiful gate. Why is it called the beautiful gate? It was inside the temple mount area, and it was located on the eastern side of the temple. It separated the court of the Gentiles from the court of the women. Now let me back up. A good teacher would have you a diagram up here. But unfortunately, I, I do well to get what I got here. So <laughs> Let me explain it to you. If you walked up to the gate when you went into the temple area, the first gate you would go into in the courtyard would be the courtyard of the Gentiles. Anybody could go in there. I said, you know, anybody could go in that area and go to the temple to worship and do whatever you want. You can get in that area. The next gate you would go through would go leave the courtyard of the Gentiles and go into the courtyard of the women. Now, the Gentiles, I don't think, could get in that area. Only That was as far as women could go, ladies. Jewish women. Jewish women. 
could go in there. They would have the uh, temple treasury there. Remember the widow threw her mites into it? She was in the courtyard of the women. Went through another gate, you went into the inner courtyard. Ladies, y'all didn't get to go there. Only Jewish men went in there. If you were a Gentile and you went in there, you could be killed on the spot. Women could get in trouble when that's as far as you could go. Another gate, you would go into the holy area where only the priests and the Levites could go. And then, of course, there was a little place inside of the inner courtyard in the holy area, which was called the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest could go in there one day a year on the Day of Atonement. Yom Kippur, they still celebrate. And that's where the Ark of the Covenant and all that was at. So this gate was the gate that took you from the court of the Gentiles into the court of women. And it was called the Beautiful Gate. It was very large and ornate. According to Josephus, it was made of Corinthian brass and was so large, it took 20 men to close the gate. A large brass gate. That's a lot. If you think about 20 strong men, it took 20 men to close the gate. This weren't a little, little door like we walked back here. It took 20 men to close the gate. So this is where we're at. Now the lame man was strategically placed at that gate to get what he needed. And spotting old Peter and John on their way to prayer meeting, he began to beg and receive alms. Now he was expecting mercy given to him in the form of money. But little did he realize he was getting to receive mercy that was something more than money could ever buy that man. So that's the scene. I've set the scene. Like I said, I, if, I, I, if I had it to do, I'd love to put me some pictures up there and slides. And I even thought Rusty had some. Rusty said, I never taught it. I don't have slides. So we were trying to find some. So that's the scene. How about the sign? Well, there's four aspects of this um, miracle that's noteworthy. First of all, it was unexpected. The guy sitting there, so you get the impression this huge crowds are pouring into the area, and Peter and John are on the way to prayer meeting. This guy, hey, buddy, can you spare a dime? Poor man, I can't walk. Can you give me something? Begging for something. And I love Luke, who's detailed when he says, and Peter and John fix their gaze upon him. The word fix their gaze is the same word that was used in chapter 1 of the apostles gazing into the sky watching Jesus ascend back to heaven. Just imagine what you would look like, feel like, if you saw the Lord raising heaven. That's the kind of uh, the gaze that is used. Peter and John look at him like, I mean, they gaze upon him. And they focus their attention on this poor, crippled man who is begging, and they command him, look at me! Or look at us. Wow. So with anticipation, what do you think the man thought? These guys are well to do. They're going to give us some money. If, he's, if they're that adamant about me looking at them, I'm going to get me some coin here. i got some supper coming tonight. So with an eager anticipation, the beggar began to pay, gave them his attention, expecting, Luke says, to receive something from them. Obviously money. And Peter's reply is one of the most famous plies in Scripture. Now, Hades was much better than this NASV that I'm reading from. See if I can remember. Silver and gold have I none. But in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. It's one of the most famous sayings in Christian history here. Totally unexpected. That man didn't expect that. He was expecting money. And now these guys said, look at me. I, I'm going to put it in down east. I ain't got no money to give you. But I got something better to give you. Totally unexpected. And no doubt, he was like, well, what can you give me better than money? <laughs> and, but he's getting ready to find out. Certainly, just like all the miracles that we read about in Scripture and miracles that happen today are all based on God's sovereignty. They're not based on anything else. Now, just think about this. MacArthur brings this as only he does, as old C.S. Lewis would teach us, we think outside the box. Now, think there was hundreds of beggars in that area. Probably a lot more people placed here because it was the best place to be. Because remember, there was a fountain one time that you could get into. And the guy said, I can't get up because I can't walk to get into it. Because they figured that if the water was stirred by an angel, it would heal him. So there's all these people here. But this was the one guy God chose. And there were certainly many other cripples there. I bet they were all crying out. Remember the blind, the blind son of David, son of, you know, have mercy on me. There was a, and it was only blind Bartimaeus and his friend. 
But this was a man that God had sovereignly chose to heal, to show signs and wonders from the previous chapter that we talked about. So expected to receive some money to help us just a momentarily, because guess what? He's going to spend the money. He's going to run out and be right back there again. The beggar was getting ready to receive something more than he would ever dream. Now remember, one of the commentators says they thought he may have been in his 40s. So he'd been living in the 30s or 40s. He'd been living most a long life not being able to walk. And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazarene, walk. So the beggar had, now the beggar had little reason to believe in Christ. He probably didn't. He may not have known who he was if he was just a Jew. Maybe he knew. I don't know. Jesus hadn't changed his plight, hadn't healed him and raised him up or anything before this. Matter of fact, he may have known that he was been executed on a cross a couple, of weeks, a couple of months earlier here. So it must have been perplexing to him to have this man use Christ's name in the midst of what he's doing. And Peter says, in the name of, which means by virtue of Christ's power and character, and he refers to him as that saying we said over and over he was called in Scripture, Jesus of Nazareth. We said, remember he was born in, I learned this a few years ago, I don't know how I didn't get over the years in Sunday school, born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth, raised in, Judea, in uh, Galilee. Because Galilee is the area, Nazareth was a town, but he was born in Bethlehem. Off of the old scripture. But they called him that as Jesus the Messiah from Nazareth. So certainly to do something in that name was something that he warned him. And he told him, get up and walk. Now, think outside the box, we're, we're almost through. If you had never walked, well, anybody ever, Angie's broke a leg. Anybody else broke any legs or feet? How? <laughs> the minute you broke it, you didn't get right back up and walk, did you? It took a little, little on. If you'd been that way your whole life, and somebody comes up and says, get up and walk, you're going to say, look, I ain't been on a walk for 40 years, or I just broke it last week. How am I going to get up and walk? So it really took a little bit of faith. In his work, but certainly, he tells him just to get up and walk. And I love this. It was, so it was, the miracle was done unexpected. He didn't expect it. didn't pray for it. didn't do anything about it. He may have been praying. We don't know it. But it was done in the name of Christ. But it was instantaneous. His confusion didn't last very long. Because you think he may be sitting there. Now this guy's telling me to get up and walk. I don't know him from Adam. But he's telling, me to get up, I don't, he's telling me to do it in the name of Christ. I don't know who that is. I heard he was killed, killed on a cross, buried, because they said he was an insurrectionist, a blasphemer, and they killed him. And, you know. and he's telling me in his name to get up and walk. He ain't giving me no money. I don't know about this. And, Peter, and Luke says he seized him by the hand. Snatched all up. Seized him by the hand. He raises him up. So I mean, it'd be like, you know, when you broke your leg or whatever, and you're laying on the bed, and somebody comes and says, all right, get up, we want to walk. Well, how am I, you know, my leg crooked over here, you know, knees out of socket or something, you know, how am I going to get up and walk? I, gotta, I was going to cast. Or if you'd never been able to walk, if you'd been born, you had polio or something, you know, you're born like this or something, you know, how am I going to walk? He, he seized it, he snatched a hold of him and raised him up. And Luke says, and immediately... His feet and ankles were strengthened. Now, if you've ever had anything broke, you know how your muscles atrophy if you don't work it. So that's why you go to the physical therapy, right? To strengthen your legs, your arms, whatever it is, to get strong so you can walk and then run and do whatever you need to do. Well, this guy didn't have to go through, he didn't have to go to Sea Level or to Moorhead or to Beaufort, wherever the physical therapist is, and go down to the therapist once a day and stretch and walk or get in the pool. Boom! The minute he grabbed a hold of him, he stood up on legs that had never been on a walk on in 47 years. So the genuine gift of healing in contrast to the alleged healing you see on TV resulted in immediate cure. And every time we see a healing from the Lord, it was instantaneous. Didn't have to, Nancy didn't have to go through six months of rehab to get better. Boom! No gradual increasing. No progressive healings. I love this quote. The beggar didn't even need to be taught how to walk. How do you know how to walk if you had never walked? Because you know, if you got little children, you know, you got to hold them and their little feet are bound. You're ready to let them walk. And they walk about two feet and they collapse, right? And then they walk about three feet and they fall. Well, they, never, they didn't know how to walk. So his feet all of a sudden, boom, stands up. 
didn't, didn't have to learn to feet, walk or anything. He just stands up and begins to walk. I love it. He says, not only did he stand up and walk, he received his coordination and balance instantaneously. If you've never been able to walk, if you've been, or you've been used to walking on crutches, it's going to take a little while to get your balance. This guy just jumps right up and he's standing. Better than that, it was a complete healing. <laughs> he began to jump around. Like the song, jump, 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 you know. I love MacArthur. Peter didn't have to manhandle him. I said like Lazarus. Yeah. <laughs> Peter didn't have to manhandle him to get him on his feet. You know, you know, what is it they always said? That, you know, you got, I remember that time we were talking about some people when they fall are like dead weight. I mean, this guy couldn't walk. They're just laying there. They can only weigh about 80 pounds soaking wet, but still, if you got to pick them up. And Peter's got to get this guy. Oh, I'm about to get him up. He weighs about 300 pounds, and he only weighs maybe 100. Maybe if he hadn't walked in 20 years. Now, you've got to remember, Peter was a fisherman, and he did a lot of hard work. He could have snatched him probably up, but he didn't need to. Yeah. This guy just starts jumping, jumping around like a song, you know? Jump, jump, jump. Leaping. And Luke says he was leaping. And it's, he. Can you, now put yourself in this guy's feet. All of a sudden, he began to feel strength through his feet and ankles. And he felt good. He said, I'm going to run. I'm going to jump. You know, I'm ready to go. You know, if you've been sick, all of a sudden you get outside. I'm ready to get some fresh air. Just run. Sometimes ain't nothing better to take off on a run, get on that treadmill and open her up. All of his symptoms were completely gone. Peter and John didn't say, well, lean on my shoulder and I'll help you get to the, I'll help you get to the temple. Nope, he and then he, his guy enters the temple and he's walking and leaping and jumping around. He didn't, he didn't just jump once. I can just imagine he's like, look at me, you know, I'm jumping around. He felt good. He's got plenty of energy. He drank one of those five-hour energy drinks. <laughs> Mere walking was not enough for this guy. He was leaping uh, just almost like a child with a new toy. He just couldn't resist to feel good about it. So the four characteristics of this mirror really provide a checklist so I, I to that. He was by God. Yes. Just Boom. Just... You think he thought about it that morning when he got up? That he was going to be jumping up and down and dancing? And Ronnie, I thought about it. The reason that they probably said, look at me, is he probably wasn't used to being talked to. No. He probably had his head down and he was, yeah. you know, wouldn't even look at whoever was coming by. He just would. And that's what just look at me like, you know, and start right. acting. Which you're right because it, one of the things that they saw in that society is if you were born that way, you must have done some kind of sin. Because remember when um, Job was going through his rigmarole, his friends kept saying, you must have done something or you wouldn't be going through what you're going through. And it was seen that somebody had done something. Your parents had sinned. Because remember the disciples would ask Jesus, has this man sinned or his parents while he's in the situation he's in? And Jesus said, no, it's for the glory of God that he says we do it. So this was... I think that's when they lowered the guy down. But anyway, he's jumping up, leaping, and it just really shows the characteristics. Well, we've got to finish. The sequel. Not only is he uh, jumping and dancing and carrying on, there were three results. First was there was joy to himself. He would just praise the Lord. Wouldn't you? <laughs> if you had one. The sedate, stately ritual of the evening sacrifice was suddenly shattered by this guy coming in, screaming and jumping down and Jesus has healed me. I mean, these guys have healed me. I've been healed. They're just dancing. Because remember, it was all prim and proper. These guys walking in here with their fancy stuff on, and they're in there. And this guy is just jumping up and down and screaming, and he is excited. Um, John would write, these th Jesus said, These things I've spoken to you that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be complete. So the first thing was this guy was happy and he was jumping around and praising the Lord. The second one was his praise wasn't just focused that he was happy. He was praising God. It was focused towards God and who God did. He gave credit to where credit is due. And I always can still remember Paul Harris always telling us when he, was, when he was a pastor. He would say, you know, we on Sunday morning get up and we pray to heal Nancy, to heal Jennifer and Cheryl. And if he heals them and we don't say thank you for it, we're sinning. Oh, I never thought about it. Paul used to say it all the time. So this guy was really uh, in true worship for the Lord. Thirdly, it became a testimony to those people that were in that temple. His outburst of praise must have caused shock and amazement on the part of the crowd. 
Because Luke tells us all the people there in the temple saw him. Couldn't deny it. There was thousands of people probably there. Because remember, he was strategically put in a place at a strategic hour at 3 o'clock in the afternoon to go there. And they saw him walking and praising God. It was a public testimony this guy had. And Luke says, and recognize him as the one who had used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple begging on. They said, that's Peter Folcher. He sat there for 30 years wanting us to give him a dime. And now look at him. He's jumping around on a, on a, one of them hop stocks, you know, one foot. What's going on here? I mean, there must have been a miracle. A miracle was undeniable. And they had seen him sitting at the beautiful gate for all those years and knew it. Later on, probably in about a week or two, we're going to get to Acts 4. And these Jewish leaders are going to say about this very event, because this is, this is going to lead to another sermon. It's going to lead to Peter and John getting arrested, taken in front of the Sanhedrin, and here's what they're going to say. What shall we do with these men? For the fact that a noteworthy miracle has taken place through them is apparent to all who live in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. So this event, we're going to talk about for the next two to three weeks, because it's going to be, he's going to give this great sermon, Peter's again, and then he's going to get arrested for doing it, and take it in front of the Sanhedrin, and they're going to tell him, don't you go out preaching in front of Jesus' name no more. And they're going to say that great statement. What you say what you're going to do, we're going to do what the Lord tells us to do. Right knowledge there. So this is what happens as a result of this. The last thing is God had designed this certainly to attract attention and point people, because remember, it could have been anybody, just a particular guy, and the healing did it. It drew attention to the crowd, who the crowd begins to run together at this place called Solomon's Portico. And they were all full of amazement. Last thing before we go. These people would have begun to remember it since they were well educated in the Old Testament, the Torah. They would have known that healings were the mark of the beginning of the Messianic times. How do they know that? Isaiah 5, 35, 6 says that when the Messiah come, he will cause, quote, then the lame will leap like a deer. And what was he doing? Leaping like a deer. Wow. Some people's lights began to go on and said, Scripture's being fulfilled. And as he had done on the previous time, a couple of days, earlier on the day of Pentecost, God used this introduction to set in gear a whole new sermon. Because all these people were amazed at his miraculous healing. And this large crowd gathers. We don't know how many people it was, but we want to find out it was a lot. On this place called the Port Portico of Solomon. Now, the last thing I'm going to tell us is so you got this in the back of your mind and we'll remind yourself next week. Now, the portico, you might know what that word stands for? Porch. We also down east call them piezers, right? The piezers of the portico, the porch of Solomon. It surrounded the out, outer court of the Gentiles. This same location in John 10 is where Jesus had given that great discourse on, I am the good shepherd. And no one, the good shepherd lays down his life for the Sheep. This is the same place Jesus gave it, which was the, one of the last parts left of Solomon's temple. Remember, David couldn't build it, Solomon built it, and it was mostly destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar when he came and took everybody into captivity, and then Herod rebuilt no, went back up. Then Ezra and Nehemiah came and they helped rebuild that temple, but it was nowhere near as good as that. And then it was rebuilt with, by, uh, God, what was his name? The guy who was head of Rome at the time when Jesus was born. Herod. Herod rebuilt the temple that was still in effect at this point. And what was left of Solomon's outer wall was this called Solomon's porch, where people gathered on the porch out there and the walk at like an overhang with these great columns on it. And so on this porch that was famous for where people would conduct business and Jesus had taught and all these people were taught, there was this man who had been lame since he was born, jumping up, I'm still thinking, he's probably jumping up down singing, praise the Lord, and Peter and John are there, and they're saying, this is living proof of this Messiah is here, and guess what? Peter is going to take it and go off on a great sermon next week, and you've got to come back next week to find the sermon. Anybody got anything to add? I told you this was a great story. I mean, it was, it was enjoyable putting this together because this is good stuff. This book is going to is kicking into gear, and you're going to see the action from here on out. Because we're getting ready to meet, we're going to meet Barnabas, we're going to meet Stephen, Philip, uh, Peter, and John. All and just good stuff coming up. But the action is beginning now. This is really sets the scene for the great sermon, 
the arrest, and then they get to stand in front of the very people who have killed Jesus and give them the same story. And once again, which I read it, they can't deny it. Anything to add? Anything to say? I was in left field about anything. Sorry to get jumping up down up here, but sometimes you got to... I don't have any slides, so i got to be theatrical. <laughs> Yeah. And who's to say he, if he was born a cripple, him, he may have not had a foot, or his foot may have been curved in. We don't, we don't know. We just know he couldn't walk, regardless. Jumping around. He's, he's celebrating, you know? Jumping around. When I jump, I'm either real happy or, or running from something. Like <laughs> I had a friend of mine at the courthouse told me the other day, he said, let me tell you something. If I'm running, there's something behind me. <laughs> You cry, I can talk about running for fun, but if I'm running, there's somebody coming after me or something. <laughs> All righty, we'll close with a prayer and then head up to the ice cream shop for ice cream shakes and whatever else it may be. Father, we just thank you once again personally for the privilege to teach and thank you for using me to teach and hopefully we've added a little excitement to this story as we've moved from 12 ordinary guys to 120 on fire men to 3,000 people and now the church is, is following the early footsteps of you and being powered by the Holy Spirit of going into the world telling others about you and the church is beginning to grow and we begin to see the miracles that are taking place and then we get to see one of those miracles and this young well, young man, this guy who's been crippled since birth is a living, breathing testimony to the power of the disciples and the power of the Spirit and Jesus himself. And they can't deny it and it's going to bring more people to you. Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you for giving us this word to understand. We ask a special blessing for everyone who's here, who's taken time in a busy week, who could be doing a myriad of things, but have chosen to come and study your word. We ask that you give them a blessing for it, hide this word in their heart so they may understand it and be excited about it and love your word. We thank you for... All those who are here, we thank you for every church that's represented here, for all the pastors, singers, musicians, teachers, or just members. Lord, we thank you, and we help us to be help us to be standing and showing others through our excitement for you to bring others to you through your word. We certainly lift up all of our pastors here. We certainly lift up our leaders in our nation. We pray for the wisdom to lead us into the future. We pray for our military who protects us and certainly for missionaries in foreign soils. We pray that they would have the gospel to take into the world. And may we continue to remember the early church that we gather together, we fellowship, follow the apostles' doctrine, and break, break bread and follow you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay.